In this video, we're going to be looking at the novel The Secret Agent, and we'll put two different editions from the Folio Society head to head in order to see which is the best. Hey, Joseph Conrad's The Secret Agent was serialized beginning in 1906, then published on its own as a proper novel the following year. Conrad is typically associated with psychological stories that take place at sea. But like Nostromo, the secret agent is very much of a place. While the former occurs in a fictional South American republic, the latter is set in a very real location of London's Soho. It is a Dickensian London that the author depicts, with rainy, gaslit streets, smoky side rooms, and gritty characters who all attempt to hold on to their own morality as the world around them becomes more complex and corrupt. The novel deals with three distinct groups who all have varying degrees of interest in each other. The politicians, the police, and the anarchists. A man named Adolf Verloc is the link between these three groups. He's the titular secret agent and his code name is Triangle. He's a member of an anarchist organization, he's an informant to the police, and he's an agent provocateur for a political embassy. When he's tasked with taking terrorist action against the Greenwich Observatory, he and his family suffer the consequences. Many of the characters in this novel seem motivated by individual perspectives, but still try to operate within the framework of the group they belong to, without getting noticed by any of their colleagues or by those outside their group. Thus, Joseph Conrad crafts one of the earliest examples of the espionage thriller, with competing political, personal, and professional concerns. The secret agent is subtitled A Simple Tale, but that's clearly ironic because the novel is quite complex and multifaceted. It's a story of plot and counterplot that isn't always focused on the violent actions themselves, but is more concerned with the motivations for them. I first encountered the novel about 10 years ago through an Everyman Library edition lent to me by a good friend. Later, I picked up this cheap trade version to add to my own collection. It's a premier classic from Knopf Publishing and features a cover image of a clock against a brick wall. This suits the book well as ticking clocks and time concerns feature prominently in the story. This copy of The Secret Agent was printed in 2008 and opens with a chronology of the author's life. After that, we get Joseph Conrad's preface to the novel where he discusses the origin of the story, which he added in 1920, 13 years after the book's initial publication. I'm a pretty big Joseph Conrad fan. He makes up a large part of my own book collection. So when I was able to upgrade to a more deluxe illustrated hardback version of this novel, I didn't hesitate. To the point where I did it twice. So let's do this. Whoa, double Conrad. As you can see, both the older and newer folio editions are larger than the standard trade paperback size. The old blue one is 2.5 centimeters taller and wider, while the new red one is also 2.5 centimeters taller, but is a little less wide. I normally save this until the end of the video, but I think this paperback can go right into the box of doom. Instead, let's explore each one of these hardcover illustrated editions in greater detail. Here we have the first release of The Secret Agent from the Folio Society, which I call Old Blue. This version was published in 1999 and is presented in a blue slipcase with a printed reproduction of Conrad's signature in silver on one side and a curved open edge for better access to the book. The book itself, like the slipcase, matches the other 16 volumes from the Joseph Conrad collection, which the Folio Society released over the course of a nine-year span from 1996 to 2005. It has a cover designed by Francis Mosley, which features the silhouette of a man in hat and jacket walking the night streets next to the Greenwich Observatory. Silver and black are used for the blocking of this image and are set against a dark blue cloth cover. On the spine, we note the author and title framed in a decorative band and the publisher name at the bottom, all in silver. The binding is finished with a blue and white headband and the binding itself is done quite well as the book opens comfortably. If we crack the book open, we see plain blue end papers in a heavy stock. The book is printed on Balmoral Wove paper, which is thick but has a bit of texture and comes in at a cream color according to color swatches. The introduction is written by Colin Ward, a prolific anarchist writer and thinker. He provides a brief biography of Joseph Conrad in terms of the author's proximity to anarchism as a political movement. Ward also looks at the background of the book's creation and explores some of its most notable themes. His introduction is eight pages long. It's followed by the 1920 author's note, just like the premier classics paperback. 
In this edition, each of the novel's 13 chapters features this little flourish, which is a detail lifted from the band on the spine, and the new chapters begin immediately after the previous ones close, rather than starting on a fresh page. Artist Francis Mosley provides 12 interior illustrations here. His work is familiar to Folio fans because in addition to providing artwork for all 17 books in the Conrad collection, he illustrated The Epic of Gilgamesh, The Silmarillion, and Chekhov's The Shooting Party. In his Conrad work, Mosley elected to experiment with linocut printing, which was unfamiliar to him at the time. Before this project, Mosley had illustrated in pen and ink, but discovered that the linocuts made for wonderfully dark, bold, and ominous forms. Because they often feature more black than white, they tend to create a sinister tone that's a perfect fit for much of Conrad's writing. The art is presented on the same stock as the text, and the images all fall immediately next to the text they coincide with, which makes for a wonderful reading experience. That's my favorite way to do it. Let's take a quick look at the artwork now. The first illustration, the frontispiece, is an image of one of the most memorable characters in the novel, the clinical bomb maker known as the Professor. The heavy shadows in the expression convey his evil nature, while the background depicts the cheap shops and lamplit streets where most of the story takes place. The second piece is an image of the protagonist, Mr. Adolf Verloc, on a bright morning walk as golden light bathes the London streets. I'm jealous of that mustache. That's a nice full mustache you got there, bud. The third illustration is of Mr. Verloc listening to the old terrorist Carl Junt discuss the need for destructive action in order to bring about change in society. Mosley does a great job capturing the ferocity that Conrad describes in The Older Man. Next, we've got an image of Mr. Verloc as he stands with his face against the window, agonizing over the dark task he's been asked to perform. This one gives me sad Joseph Stalin vibes. The fifth illustration is of the Assistant Commissioner of Police, who meets with Chief Inspector Heat to discuss the investigation. The inkstand on his desk and the speaking tubes behind his chair reveal a nice attention to detail here. The sixth image is of a setting detail as two horses feed while their driver refreshes himself in a restaurant. These lino cut prints lend themselves well to nighttime scenes like this. This one might be my favorite of the bunch. It's of the driver who comes to pick up Mr. Verloc's mother-in-law, and his grim countenance and his hooked hand unnerves her and frightens her son Stevie. The eighth piece is also strong because of its ominous foreshadowing. Winnie Verloc prepares her husband's supper, and she tests the edge of the knife's blade. There's a lot of drama in the ninth illustration of a tense standoff between an embassy official and the assistant commissioner of police. We can feel the tension in their looks, and Mosley includes the two carriage drivers that Conrad described as being perfectly still, as if carved in stone in the background here. The tenth image is of Mr. and Mrs. Verloc who attempt to deal with their unhappy state. The eleventh illustration is another striking piece. The linocut medium enables the artist to present the bold image with interesting perspective and dramatic heavy black forms, which fit the tone of the book so well. And the final image is also fantastic, featuring a depiction of the concluding conversation between the professor and comrade Ossipon. They're discussing acts of madness and despair, as Ossipon wrestles with what he knows of an impenetrable mystery. And it also provides nice symmetry, as this edition opens and closes with an image of the professor. And here we have the folio version of The Secret Agent that came out in 2019 and is presented in a flat black slipcase with a triangle and a sunburst logo in glossy black on one side. The book itself has a striking cover designed by Ben Jones. It features a great collage style composition with that same circle and triangle image from the slipcase at its base, except in orange. Above this is the face of The Secret Agent with another figure laid out dead below. The negative space of the pool that that figure lies in also takes the shape of a woman's profile, and she is shedding a single tear. Around it all, the orange and black bursts converge in an explosion emanating out from the center. The surface of this image is all slightly recessed back from the red cloth covered board, which gives the whole image a great layered effect with multiple textures at play. On the spine, we note the triangle image at the top in orange, with the author, title, and folio logo in black. The binding is finished with a black headband. I find the binding to be a little too tight, even after being broken in and read through once. I think this might be due to excessive glue between the signatures. And it should also be said that the slipcase itself is also a touch tight, 
Readers will want to exercise care in removing and returning the book to its slipcase. When we crack this book open, we see plain red end papers in a slightly lighter hue than the color from the cover. The book is printed on Folio's current go-to Abbey Wove paper, which is smooth and is close to ultra white here, according to color swatches. If we bring back old blue for a brief side-by-side, -side, we can see that new red has brighter paper, but the darkness of the ink is the same as is the font size. The new red version boasts better spacing between the lines, while the old blue one has better side margins that result in less gutter crowding. Both books come in at exactly 270 pages, but in the new red one, each chapter starts on a fresh page. It also features a brief biography for each of the key contributors to this edition. The introduction is written by Will Self. He's an author, journalist, and broadcaster. He briefly considers Conrad's style and discusses some recent examples of historical terrorism and politics to help emphasize the contemporary nature of this over 100-year-old novel. He focuses on the motif of time in the novel and provides some really helpful and compelling insights about the book. This introduction is eight pages long and is especially well written. Yet again, we get Conrad's author's preface or note from 1920. Artist Ben Jones provides seven interior illustrations here. He's familiar to folio fans who may have seen his illustrations for A Clockwork Orange. Jones has a unique style to his work which combines printed shapes, drawn elements, and found imagery. This results in appropriately unsettling illustrations due to the combination of simplified elements like clothing and background with the realism of the repurposed photographic elements for faces and hands. There is a gritty texture within these black, white, and red images that make them feel like they've been pulled from old newspapers or cheap propaganda pamphlets. The art is presented on a toothy and slightly thicker stock, and the images all land within five pages of the text they coincide with. Now let's take a detailed look at this artwork. The frontispiece is of the inside counter of the Verloc's shop on Brett Street. We see Mr. Verloc and Winnie here, and note Winnie Verloc's indifferent expression. The key details from the shop are all visible, including the cheap ink that they sell. The lewd materials and the bell, which announces when anyone comes in from the street, are in red here. Note the texture quality. Simulated aging, wrinkles in the page, and printing errors all contribute to the gritty mood of this image, and we'll see these techniques carry over to the others. The second piece is of Mr. Vladimir, first secretary of an unnamed foreign embassy in London. While the Verlocs were depicted as seated in front of smutty pornography, Mr. Vladimir is in front of an ornately framed classical image. That, and the details of his costume, suggest that he comes from a far more extravagant background. The third illustration is of the conversation between Chief Inspector Heat and his superior, the Assistant Commissioner. Again, this scene is across a desk, and again, it's all about power dynamics. The high-ranking police commissioner is depicted in red, while Inspector Heat is enlarged to the point of distortion. In his hands, he holds the central clue to the case, a torn bit of cloth that will show up again. The fourth image is of Mr. Verloc and his brother-in-law Stevie, out for a walk. The city behind them is in red, and you'll note that the red falls to the background in each of the next three images. The most important detail of this particular image is the gentle characterization found in Stevie's downturned face. The fifth illustration has Chief Inspector Heat put his bit of cloth evidence on the counter in front of Winnie Verloc. She's depicted in white, and we can see her great distress despite the absence of distinct features on her form. The sixth image is the best of the bunch. Mr. Verloc, exhausted and upset, lies down on the sofa. He sees the shadows of an arm with a knife raised moments before it's too late. The drama of the scene is conveyed well here, and I like how the shadow falls on the walls and spills onto the ceiling. The final image is of Winnie Verloc. She's dressed in black and is veiled. Beyond the pale moon, there's very little white in this image. It's almost all grayscale, which is perfect, since Conrad describes her in this scene as merging with the night, like a figure half chiseled out of stone. Ben Jones uses touches of red for the gas lantern, the mist vapors, and the clouds that also obscure Winnie from view here. So which folio edition of The Secret Agent is best? I have a special affinity for the Complete Joseph Conrad collection, so it's hard to look past my love for that series when it comes to individual volumes. The old blue version does have a better binding, and the artwork is more to my tastes. There's also almost twice as many illustrations in the old blue version. However, I can't deny the unique strengths of the new red version. It has a better cover, a stronger introduction, and the aesthetic elements of the design, like the echoed triangular motif on the spine and slipcase, are just more unified here. Now price and availability could be factors for others trying to decide between the two. 
On the secondary market, the old blue version is often much more affordable. But it's almost 25 years old now, so securing a copy in a condition you're comfortable with may be difficult. The new red version is currently available from Folio Society's website. If I had to pick one and wasn't concerned with collecting the whole blue set, I think I'd have to go with the newer red edition. But luckily, I don't have to make that choice. Ultimately, both editions feature the Folio Society's typically impressive attention to detail and exemplify their commitment to well-designed and well-built books. Moving forward, I'm going to have to ease up on the double up, because if I keep getting two great editions for every one paperback I get rid of, I won't have any more room for more new books. As always, thanks for watching, and if you'd like more content, stay tuned to this channel or circle back to previous videos.